residency in neurology at the Western University, as well as a clinical fellowship here in our own MS clinic. Um, on top of that, um, she has a master's degree in epidemiology, um, and uh, I guess she got that. Ah, uh, no, where did she get that? What did it say? I think you're at the, the University of Buffalo. Okay. Um, she's also completed a two-year research fellowship on cognition and in MS specifically, and she has um, opened um, the first um, cognition in MS research um, and um, clinic actually here in London, Ontario. Uh, she also does inter uh, has interests in cognitive impairment in MS, in relapse treatment, epidemiology, and cognition, of course, which she's here to speak on. So help me in welcoming uh, Dr. Morrow with us tonight. Thanks, very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming out on this freezing cold night. Um, I'm glad this is not so I'm going to talk, as Terry said, about cognition and MS. I'm actually going to move this aside just because I'm so short and I can barely see over it. Is that all right, everyone? Oh, shoot. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, I want to talk about the importance of recognizing cognitive impairments in MS patients in your friend and family. Um, how it's commonly presents. It's not what you think of when you think of dementia. So it's important to see the difference between the two. Things that can affect MS cognition, because of course, no one thing in MS is unaffected by the other things in MS. And then talk about some treatment options, which unfortunately is the shortest section I have, um, but we're, we're working on that right now. So what is cognition itself? So if you look it up in the dictionary, it's Trigger. Here, ah, thank you. So if you look up in the dictionary, you can say anything from mental processes to faculty of knowing and perceiving things. Uh, my more detailed de definition is the mental process of knowing. So when you think of that kind of in lay terms, <laughs> came back last time. There we go. It's just perfecting the image every time. So <laughs> it's up here, maybe. <laughs> so it's the ability to learn and remember things. Uh, your ability to plan and solve and organize. Uh, your ability to focus, shift your attention from one thing to another when you can. Your ability to use language and to accurately perceive what's going on around you as well as, of course, perform calculations or mail. So what's the impact of cognitive impairment in MS patients? And the first real study that looked at this was way back in 1991. Um, Steve Rayo, who was one of the very first, uh, who I guess led the, led the research in MS and cognition. He's quite a big name in MS and cognition, Steve Rayo. And he was the first one to look at 100 MS patients, and he just took the next 100 MS patients he saw in his clinic, and he's a psychologist. And he assessed them both in his clinic with um, tests that took almost all day. He also went to their home with an occupational therapist and did a two-hour home assessment, did some self-report scales from the patient themselves as well as their friends and family, and then of course looked at other things like uh, baseline intelligence, how much education they achieved, as well as their other aspects of their disease, uh, so how physically disabled they were, how bad their fatigue was, other things that might impact their quality of life. And what he found, which is really interesting, is if you look at those who are affected. So what he did is he looked at how these, how the, all these characteristics affected uh, their daily functions, the things that most people do on a daily basis. So when he looked at 
different work status, the people who were not affected, meaning they were cognitively intact, were much more likely to still be working. And whereas those who were cognitively impaired were more likely to be disabled. Same with when you look at social activity, meaning how much they actually went out and interacted with their peers, both family and friends. And the other one was the people who had cognitive impairment were low, more likely to need some assistance in doing things on a daily basis. Now, there is some difference here you can see, but that wasn't greater than chance, so it's not considered what we call significant. But certainly, all those things that are very important for day-to-day -day quality of life can be affected with cognitive impairment. Uh, the other thing that uh, Rayo found was that family and friends reported there seemed to be more confusion and that they were more, or there was more emotional instability. So um, crying, it was still in an appropriate way, but crying earlier than you would expect or um, becoming angry early when you expect. There were still emotions that were appropriate, but maybe a little bit earlier than you would expect for the situation. And that they were more socially withdrawn, meaning, same as I said earlier, less likely to inter interact with their friends and family. And this was even true when they controlled for depression, because of course depression can cause a lot of those symptoms too, which is also common in them. And so his conclusion was that cognitive impairment is the most devastating symptom for MS patients and their families. And I often say this to my patients in the clinic, and if you've seen me, you've heard me say it is, it's easy for people to make accommodations if they can see the deficit. So if you're using a cane or you're in a wheelchair, people understand the deficit. But people don't get it when it's something they can't see. They can't see that you're thinking slowly or having trouble with your memory. So it's harder for other people to understand and be able to accommodate the problems you're having. So cognitively, MS, cognitively impaired MS patients will have a loss of self-esteem because they feel like they can't do what they used to be able to do. It's associated with a higher rate of sexual dysfunction. And it's also associated with a higher rate of divorce. And that goes back to the understanding is that it's easier to understand something you can see, and that's from the spouse point of view as well. It's easier to understand something you can see than something you can't see and can't understand. So it has a huge impact on family and your social relationships. On top of that, another thing that's really important is that cognition, of course, is really important in driving. You need to be able to multitask. You need to be able to react quickly. And so people who are um, cognitively impaired are more likely to have car accidents as well as make traffic violations. And that's very important too because not only is it a sense of independence, but if you want to continue working, often you need to be able to drive to be able to stay fully employed. So it's, it has a huge impact on patients' quality of life. Oh shoot, it went again. Oh sure. Really? Okay. No one's ever asked me to be louder before. This is nice. Actually, okay. the game was on. We might hear it better. This went off. Ah, gotcha. Okay. But I'll still try and be louder. Please let me know if you can't hear me. It gave me enough time for the slide to come up. Perfect. <laughs> so the other thing that's really important is that cognitive impairment or cognitive dysfunction has a very uh, poor correlation or a low... Um, it doesn't always go with uh, physical disability. So someone may be in a wheelchair, but their cognition is fully intact. And other people may be completely physically able. So we, you wouldn't even know they have MS looking at them, and yet cognitively they are doing very poorly. And that makes it harder to make that correlation around disability and being able to say, oh, well, this person needs help because their cognition is impaired because you can't see it. And uh, there was one study by Amato. She's out of uh, Europe. And she looked at what we call benign MS. So for those of you who don't know what that definition is, it's basically someone who's had MS for more than 15 years, so diagnosed with MS at least 15 years ago, and has what we call an EDSS less than three meaning very little physical disability. Any disability that we see or that you see is not interfering with your quality of life. You can still do everything you want to do. So very little physical disability. So that's called benign MS. Unfortunately, it's a retrospective diagnosis. But um, when Amato, when she looked at a whole bunch of MS patients who were considered benign in terms of meaning how physically impaired they were, she found that most of them were actually cognitively impaired. And when you look at the cognitively impaired patients, um, there's 11 of them out of a whole group of 50 that were impaired. And it was uh, more common in men than it was in women. And it seemed to go along with those who had more depression. But it did not go along with those who had physical disabilities. So they all had really, really low physical disability and did 
didn't go along with how long they had the disease. The people who had no cognitive impairment had the disease for on average 22 years, whereas those who were impaired 23. So we're very close together. That had no effect. And education as well. Theirs was not significantly different between the two. They had it both the same in terms of, of how much education they had, as well as age. So none of those really predicted how well people were going to do in terms of their cognition. And the other thing that we found recently is that we can also see cognitive impairment as early as clinically isolated syndrome. So most of you have, were probably a clinically isolated syndrome at some point. So it's what we call the precursor to relapsing or admitting multiple sclerosis. So it's someone who has had one event of neurological dysfunction, so basically their first relapse, but have not yet shown that it's a chronic illness. So they haven't shown either a second event or new lesions on their MRI. Something to show this chronic as opposed to just a one-time thing. And when they've done two studies where they looked at people who came in with clinically isolated syndrome, meaning they was their first evidence of any physical problems. Now they had changes on their MRI that were suggestive of MS, but they didn't have the diagnosis yet. In this group, they were seen within three months of their actual physical impairment. And 57% of them already met the diagnostic criteria for cognitive impairment. Now I think that's a little bit high. There may have been some cell selection for that. Um, they also picked people for this study who had a high birth of disease on their MRI, so lots and lots of activity on their MRI, so that might have something to do with it. I think that's a higher number than we would see in our clinic, for instance. And this study looked at all comers, so relapsed and remitting, secondary progressive, primary progressive, and clinically isolated syndrome. And when they looked at it, it was about a third of the patients had some sort of cognitive impairment. And it really didn't differ from those who had MS in terms of what kind of impairment they had. It was, they had trouble with their uh, except the difference was in terms of their memory, which we'll get into. So at least those who had their first event, not yet MS, had better memory than those who had MS. So how do we recognize cognitive impairment in our, in our friends and family or in ourselves? Well, one thing is, is probably most of you realize we haven't really been talking about cognition in MS until recently. Really, it's only been a big topic since the last 10 years. As you remember, that first study I showed you by Steve Rayo, who really is the guru for cognitive impairment research, the grandfather if you want to think of it that way, that study was published in 1991. So that's really not that long ago that we just started exploring cognitive impairment in MS patients. Yet, as early as 1877, Charcot, who is a, a neurologist, obviously, in 1877, <laughs> he noticed that early that people with MS could have cognitive impairment. So he noticed that at a certain stage of the disease, patients with MS may show marked enfeeblement of the memory, conceptions are formed slowly, the intellectual and emotional faculties are blunted in their en ent entirety. So it's noticed as early as 1877. So why has it taken us so long to realize that it's a problem? Well, we think one of the reasons might be that we tend to think as neurologists, we tend to think of cognitive impairment as what we see in dementia. So what we see in Alzheimer's disease or what we see in vascular dementia or what you see in people as they get older in their 80s and 90s, that kind of memory problems. That's what we really think of as cognitive impairment as neurologists. That's how we're trained. And yet in MS, intellectual function and language skills, which are the two most commonly affected things in Alzheimer's disease, remain intact. So those are things that aren't affected. So someone with MS can carry on a conversation and they don't seem to have any, they don't seem to struggle unless you stress them in certain ways. So it's not very easy for neurologists or even other people to recognize it sometimes, especially if you're not looking for it. And this just tells you how bad neurologists are at uh, discovering or detecting cognitive impairment in MS patients. They did a study where they looked at, uh, they asked neurologists after interviewing an MS patient, whether they thought they were cognitively impaired or cognitively normal. And if they thought the patient was cognitively impaired, they were right 90% of the time. Whereas if they thought the patient was cognitively normal, they were just as good as flipping a coin. They were only right 50% of the time. And likely what was happening in this, although it's not published in the paper, but just based on my experience, is these are the people who are very cognitively impaired. So the ones where it's obvious to everyone, including their family members, who often, often, often already have help in the home because their cognition is very impaired. So when they're that bad, all of us can detect it. But when it's more subtle, when it's something that might be affecting your work, but you're able to compensate for it, or you're taking longer to do things, you're not able to leave work till later because everything's taking longer, 
or you're noticing at home, you're not keeping up with things at home, and you're not able to remember everything you can, those are the more subtle ones that the neurologist was not very good at picking up. So it's really hard for friends and family to notice it if we as trained neurologists can't even pick it up. One other reason that I think that cognition has now become a little bit more prominent is that we lucky enough to have medications that some of you may be on that have really helped with the physical impairment. So we used to, you know, we used to not have anything to prevent patients from becoming disabled. And nowadays we can. And so when we, now that we've prevented a lot of the physical disability, we're suddenly seeing cognition being much more, not prevalent, but more prominent. It was probably there before, but now it's becoming the reason why people are leaving work rather than their physical disability, because we've been able to delay the progression either by decreasing the relapse or decreasing the brain atrophy through the medications we have now. So through those two things, one, us not recognizing it, and two, it becoming a more of a prominent symptom than just the physical impairment, I mean, that's why we're, it's, even though it's been there forever, we're still considering a new topic in MS. <coughs> so, if it doesn't affect intellectual function like Alzheimer's, and it doesn't affect uh, aphasia, which is being able to name things, recognizing objects, knowing what the name of certain things are, people and places, how does MS affect cognition? And so it's a little bit different. The most common one is actually attention and processing speed. So that's... <coughs> Uh, the ability to focus on one thing, to be able to ward out distractions, to be able to multitask, so be able to do two things at once. So, you know, having, um, while you're cooking, having someone interrupt you and remind you that to set the alarm for something later. You'll be able to remember both those things. Your ability to shift your attention from one thing to another. So focusing on something, the phone rings, you go to answer the phone, you're able to get back on task or you're able to remember what that person said on the phone when you go back to the original task. That's shifting attention, processing speed, paying attention. Those are the most common problems you see. You do see memory problems, but you see it more in what we call verbal or visual spatial memory. So it's that you can't, it's that tip of the tongue phenomenon where you know the word, but you can't get it. But it's not like I could show you an apple and you wouldn't know what to call it. You know what an apple is. That's more the Alzheimer's type. Whereas you're like, oh, I just can't think of it. And you might do word associations like, I know it's a fruit, I'm going through them, and you'll come up with the word because you know it. But it's, get, it's actually drawing it from your memory. Or visual spatial memory, so MS patients are more likely to have trouble assembling things, uh, or with driving, knowing directions, those kind of things. That's where we get a little bit more concerned. Executive function is less commonly affected, uh, only in about 20% of patients, but when it's affected, it's, it's quite devastating because a lot of people with MS problems with attention and memory and processing speed can compensate it for it because their executive function is intact. That's your ability to plan, your ability to problem solve. So you might say, okay, I know I'm going to have trouble doing this task tonight. I'm coming to this talk that Dr. Moore is giving and I'm going to forget half of what she said, so I'm going to bring a recorder so I can listen to it when I get home. That's an idea of planning, knowing where your deficit is and planning so that you can compensate for it. If you have trouble with planning and with problem solving, then it's hard for you to actually compensate for the other problems you might be having. So less common, but it's really devastating when you do see it. And here's just another quick slide along the same lines, just showing you how commonly how common these different symptoms are in MS patients. So you can see processing speed is right up there, and so is visual memory. Luckily, this is a concept formation or what you can call executive function much lower, um, and verbal fluency uh, is lower, but uh, it still can be a common complaint, partly because processing speed is involved, of course, with coming up with the right word. When you look at what happens to patients who are cognitively impaired, what you find is that it shows a slow, progressive worsening. Unlike relapses where things come on quickly and you notice it within a day or so, this tends to be something you notice over months to years. And it does seem to have a, a snowball effect in the sense that the people who are more likely to stay cognitively intact are the ones who are already cognitively intact. And the ones who are more likely to show progression are those who are already showing symptoms. So if you follow people over time, the trajectory is a bit different if they say there is already cognitive impairment present. So this is Amato that I talked about before. She's done a lot of studies. 
and what she found when she followed uh, MS patients over 10 years is that although initially three quarters of them were normal, they had no cognitive problems, it decreased to just around 50% at four and 10 years. And she found the best predictor of those who were going to become cognitively impaired were those who were not impaired but failed one test. One, so they didn't quite get to the impairment, but they already failed one test or sometimes borderline of normal on another test. So there was already something there that just got worse over time. And unfortunately, no one showed any improvement over time in her study. Similarly, this is another study where they looked at patients over a three-year period, people who had had MS for about 12 years, whereas the last study, they were less than three years who had MS. So this is a little bit of a longer duration. And they didn't have a lot of physical disability. And they compared people who were cognitively normal, cognitively impaired, and of course normal controls, just to see if there was any difference. And they found that those who were normal cognitively at the beginning, both normal controls, and then those who had normal impairment, who had normal cognition, they stayed about the same over time. But over three years, the ones who worsened were the ones who already were showing problems. So the best thing to do with once we have better treatments is to catch it early and try and either prevent it or stabilize it as soon as we possibly can. What about other things that can affect our cognition? As you know, nothing in MS works in isolation. So you may have numb and tinglys, and when you get fatigued, your numb and tinglys get worse. So just like that with cognition, it's, it's all, they all kind of influence each other. So this is just a quick slide, because I'm going to go into a lot of even detail. Fatigue can affect cognition. So as you know, 75% of MS patients report fatigue and it can subjectively make you feel like you're not doing as well. Most of the time, patients can are doing better than they think. It's the fatigue that's making them feel like they're slower. Now, this is generalized fatigue, that whole body fatigue that you guys described to me as like walking through deep water or just, you know, I have no energy, my legs feel like they weigh 100 pounds. Not cognitive fatigue, which is a bit different, which is the longer you do something, the more tired you get. But generalized fatigue can cause you to feel as if you just can't think straight. Depression, really common in up to MS, in 50% of MS patients. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Drugs, of course, with the multitude of problems that can come with accumulating souvenirs from our relapses. Sometimes people have to take medications for pain or for bladder or for other things that can also worsen cognition. So we know that narcotics sometimes can. We know that uh, certain anti-epileptic, anti-seizure drugs that we use for pain can cause it. Uh, there's some evidence that uh, um, marijuana, actually a lot of evidence that marijuana can cause problems with memory as well, although we sometimes need to use it for pain as well. And then there's, we don't know if this happens in MS patients, we're actually looking into that right now in our clinic, but anticholinergics, which are medications you use for bladder when you've got that bladder urgency, like, oh my goodness, i got to get there. The medications we use to help that in Alzheimer's worsen in cognition. So we don't know if it happens in MS patients or not. We're looking into that right now. But that might be something else that affects your quality of life, so you need a medication for your bladder. That might affect your cognition as well. So it's all this interplay between all the different aspects of MS. And then, of course, we're always unlucky enough to have more than one thing. It's not just MS. We have to have something else going on. And other things can do it. So attention deficit disorder, a brain injury, other psychiatric illnesses, all those can affect cognition as well. So there's this huge interplay of different things that can affect cognition, not just MS itself, which makes it even harder when you or we are trying to figure out what's going on to figure out how we can help. Depression, it's such a common symptom in patients. And this is not just a reaction to, oh my goodness, I have MS, what does this mean for me and how is it gonna impact my life? There is a correlation between MS and depression that there's probably something in the underlying pathology that causes MS or from the plaques that are caused by MS, the demyelinating plaques, that puts you at higher risk for depression or even causes depression directly. So it's really common. So if you look at all comers, MS patients will suffer from MS. One in two MS patients will have depression at some point in their lifetime. It's a really high number. And the risk of suicide is seven times higher in MS patients than it is in the general population. That's a really, really big number. And it seems to be highest in young males within five years of diagnosis. They seem to take it the hardest, but it certainly happens in people who have had the disease longer and in females. But it's a big problem. 
and depression is thought to interfere with cognition in isolation from other things. So it has a lot of impact on working memory. So a good example, though none of us use phone books anymore, is going and looking at a phone book, and looking down the number, memorizing the number, and then walking to the phone. That's working memory, being able to remember it from that short amount of time, looking from one point to another, and then that's erased from your memory. You don't have to ever remember it again. That's working memory. It affects processing speed. Again, that ability to take in information and use it quickly, your ability to multitask, shift attention, pay attention to two things at once. And of course, being able to pay attention, warding off the other things that aren't important and being able to focus solely on what you need to pay attention to. And then planning, some executive tasks, planning, not necessarily problem solving, but more planning. And the thought is that the reason that depression does this is that because depression um, reduces your overall capacity to process information, by using the resources that you would normally use for planning, processing, speed, memory, are used on the negative feedback that's coming from depression. That and too much of your brain capacity is being used to think about the negative things or the guilt associated with it or the, um, the other negative symptoms that are associated with MS, uh, sorry, with depression that take up enough brain use that you don't have enough left for the other things that you need to be able to do in your daily life. So there's less resources available for the other things you need to do. And if you add that on to someone who has maybe a little bit of cognitive impairment, but they're doing great, but you add that on to someone, put the two together, and you can suddenly see a lot of problems in MS patients who wouldn't otherwise have it. The good thing with this is that treating the depression often corrects that problem. Even though it, it's, there is cognitive impairment, we can get you back to a place where you were functioning normally. And it's kind of almost like it's unmasking something that's there that you're able to compensate for, but that depression just kind of throws you down. Anxiety is another big problem in MS, and I have to say, as practitioners, this is another area where we struggle to deal with anxiety. It's something that we're not, um, not well trained to do, even though it's such a common symptom. So this is a UK, uh, this is a MS registry in the U United Kingdom in England, and they were looking at patients, uh, they're doing anxiety scores. So you can see this is 100% of people, only a quarter of them had no anxiety only quarter, that's not a, that's a very small number. And up to 10% had what was considered severe anxiety. But even moderate anxiety is still over a third. So that's a huge number, that's a lot of problems. And it's more common in women, and it's more common in relapsing women in multiple sclerosis than the primary progressive or secondary progressive. And anxiety has been shown to affect cognition in MS as well. So this study was done, they looked at just over 100 patients with MS. And they did their cognitive testing and also asked them to say, do you think you're impaired or do you think you're normal? And so 39 were considered uh, cognitively impaired. And most of them, when they were cognitively impaired, said, yes, I'm cognitively impaired. I'm having trouble. But 69% were normal and 51% of them said that they were impaired, even though they were normal. And the biggest predictor of saying that they were impaired when they weren't was anxiety. That was the biggest thing, more than depression, was what pa made patients feel like they were not performing cognitively at their best. So anxiety has a huge impact on cognition. And then of course, depression and anxiety run together. Just to complicate the matter, people who have depression are more likely to have anxiety, and people who have anxiety are more likely to have depression. So it just really adds up and, and ends up being a big problem. So. We talked about this, people with severe anxiety, almost 60% of them will also have depression. And those with severe depression, three quarters of them will also have anxiety. So it really runs together. And when you have both of them, this is when we really worry because it has to do with more suicidal ideation, more thoughts about suicide, more alcohol abuse, more trouble with somatic complaints, that's things like not being able to sleep, changes in appetite, things that are on a daily basis. And then of course, when you've got depression and anxiety, you don't want to go out and have, go to a party or a social event. You don't want to see your friends and socialize because you're feeling so horrible about yourself. So this is a huge impact on quality of life. And it also brings out the cognitive impairments. Put all those three together and it's something that we really need to address in order to improve quality of life. One thing that's interesting